And I'll pull up my page here. All right, if you are all ready, we will get started. Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our week 10 World of Art. My name is Dakota Harkins. And I'm the Director of Education and Heritage Programming here at Lakeside Chautauqua. Both yesterday and today, we will be reviewing the world of art in new ways, new concepts that you might not have attributed to art before. Um, and if you would like to view previous programs from yesterday, those are available both on Facebook and on our lakesideohio.com calendar. And you can access those through the virtual purple banner that's on each of the dates for the programs. All previous programs from the Chautauqua Lecture Series are also available on the calendar. And many of them, you can go to the Lakeside Facebook page and view those as well. So today's morning program is going to be focusing on design-based learning for the future. And as we're going through, um, I'd like to make a note that for those of you who are active in the Zoom webinar this morning, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen for questions at the end of the program. But our speaker this morning will also be taking some polls throughout. Um, and for those, of, for those questions, those can be answered. Um, those responses can be put in the chat icon, which is also in that same row of icons at the bottom of your Zoom page. If you're watching on Facebook, we'll be taking both the poll questions and your questions for the end of the program in the comments section and saving those uh, for the end of the program. So with all of that, I am pleased to introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Robin Van de Zand. Dr. Van de Zand is a professor of art education at Kent State University and her research on design education has been cited internationally. Um, and she has been the leader in many movements, many groups um, to expand that field. So we are thrilled to have her with us this morning, even though she is going into um, a pretty contentious fall semester here, but welcome this morning, Dr. Van de Zand. Oh, thank you, Dakota. I'm glad to be here and I'm sorry I can't see the audience, but it certainly is nice that they are joining us. Yeah. Um, so I will just comment on the semester at Kent State it is going to be interesting. Um, I'm sure people are very curious about that. We'll have about 25% capacity on campus, primarily freshmen who will be in the dorms and everybody will be expected to follow very strict protocols of how to stay safe. So it, yes, the rest of the people will be teaching remotely. It's going to be a very interesting semester. So I will get started talking about my research area of design-based learning. So I'm going to stop my video and share my screen. <clears throat> Dakota, are you able to see this? Yes, we can see that. Good. Okay. I wanted to make sure it was visible to everyone. Education is essential to help us understand concepts in and outside of the world we live in. All of us have been involved in education in one way or another. So I'd, I'd like to just start to give you a little of my background and how I happen to be speaking on this topic. Education has been part of my life since kindergarten. In kindergarten, of course, I was a student, but I did show signs of being a teacher when I was six because I used to line up all my dolls in my home classroom. Now I have to comment that I did have a younger sister, but she was a challenge and I just wasn't equipped to deal with her but my dolls were an attentive group and I taught them very important things. Then in the summer before my senior year in high school, I got to see teaching in action as a teacher's aide in a fourth grade classroom in Texas. I went on a church mission trip and we were teaching Mexican migrant workers children. It was just an amazing experience. I learned a great deal watching the teacher with these students who basically used English as a second language. And the one thing I remember the most was from a little girl who painstakingly made a card when it was time for me to leave. And she wrote this heartfelt message 
that said, Robin is a girl. I, I didn't quite know what to say, but then realized that she had a very limited English vocabulary and it was a nice gesture. So I taught in elementary, middle and high schools before teaching in higher ed. In higher ed, I have researched design-based learning and design thinking, which is a form of problem solving. All of that has led me to my current focus of improving education in a broad way. Now I understand that this week is focusing on art, um, visual arts I assume, because design isn't typically thought of as fine art or crafts, but a, a separate area of the visual arts. And that's, that's primarily what I've been researching, though I am a, the coordinator of the art and design education program at Kent State. So last summer, I was fortunate enough to chair an international symposium in Florence, Italy. It involved 40 people representing 14 countries. We spent three days together working through the challenge of how education could change to address current issues and to shape a better world. Of course, we had no idea how things would change and how we would be viewing education less than a year later. In the next few slides, I will touch on some of the concepts that make this a time for an educational transfer transformation. Not a time for reform. Education undergo undergoes reforms frequently. Many of those work well, some don't. But based on the fact that things are changing faster than in any time in history, we have to start transforming the way we think about and do things in schools. A formal education is the next most significant role of educating and socializing students outside of their home. What is the typical profile of young children starting school today? Well, in general, their education has started to be shaped from the age that they were able to use a touch screen on a device. Their socialization began in childcare. For some, as young as six weeks, old, and they arrive at kindergarten with more sophistication than previous generations and full of random knowledge that must be fostered or remediated. And now we add the pandemic. Educators like others around the world are challenged with doing the job the, the way they want to and the best they can. The traditional approach to teaching is not an option right now. Education was starting to shift because of the factors mentioned in the last slide, but this will be the biggest game changer. When a vaccine is developed and our populace gets the vaccine, students and teachers will be back in their classrooms, but things will be different. Using technology to teach remotely will have a profound effect on how things are done in the future. Some of the face-to-face -face approaches work best and some of the distance learning strategies will be worth preserving. There are several issues that have led to the conditions we are now seeing in K-12 schools. Now, I don't intend to talk about all of these, but wanted you to know I have this list if you would like to look this over in more detail later when the PowerPoint is available to you. I am going to talk about a couple of the things that have impacted changes in education in the last 20 years. No Child Left Behind was one of those. School reformers made standardized test scores the chief metric of student achievement and school effectiveness. The term is associated with large scale tests administered to large populations of students. Now, part of the problem is that no child left behind was based on conformity. But, but how many of you have had your own children or who have worked with children and know that they aren't the same? Every child is unique. So this is a narrow way to assess students. The addition of no child left behind was influenced by the corporate world in an effort to create a more competitive workforce, thinking that this was the way to improve the economy. It was also an effort to move education to the private sector, to get public schools off the tax rolls and offer 
yet another way for business to make a profit. In 2015, the average student in America's big city public schools took 112 mandatory standardized tests between pre-kindergarten and the end of 12th grade. That's an average of about eight tests per year. What has happened? The high stakes has caused a focus on test preparation and the narrowing of the curriculum in most schools, as well as the over-testing of students. Now, after 17 years, research shows that students who were immersed in standardized tests throughout their education are not very adept in researching, thinking creatively, or analyzing problems for themselves. Even when in 2016, the Every Student Succeeds Act was passed and it modified things a bit, but things haven't really gotten that much better. States must still test, but have flexibility in how and when, emphasis on different kinds of tests that more accurately measure what students are learning are available, but this act still maintains an annual assessment, testing every child each year from third to eighth grade in math and English language arts and once in high school and three times during their schooling in science. There has been pressure because of this high stakes testing for teachers to teach to the test, as I mentioned. But educators have always known that this is not how to get students to really learn. It is best to teach things as they are relevant to the individual students, provide engaging hands-on experiences, but many of these strategies take time. Teachers have to have their students ready for the spring test, no matter if students are rushed and have not really absorbed the information. So it's hard to use some of those effective strategies. It, it's just a tough call. Just a little meme I recently read, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but, it, but I think as an educator, this feels very accurate. You know you're an educator when you've had your profession slammed by someone who would never dream of doing your job. One of the largest international tests is the Program for International Student Assessment, which is PISA, and it measures reading ability, math, and science literacy, and other key skills among 15-year-olds in developing countries every three years. Here are the most current results. Out of 79 countries, we ranked 36th in math, 13th in reading, and 16th in science. And another test, the National Assessment of Education Progress, uh, that test um, tests US fourth and eighth graders every two years in math and reading. In the US, achievement has not progressed over the past decade. And in low performing students, no progress has been made over 30 years of this test. I show these statistics because they defy what our extraordinary teachers and the talented students they teach are capable of doing. This is a small sample of what teachers try or want to do with their students. You can read these in more detail later. The point I'm trying to make is that teachers are the backbone of our schools. They are trained to mentor, stimulate, and engage their students to help them learn the content of different subjects. But the dominant culture in most school districts is standardized tests. As education specialist Ken Robinson has stated, these tests do have some use. It's much like medical tests that suggest where the problem lies and may support a diagnosis but they do not provide a treatment. If we want our students to learn, we need an engaging education that gives attention to all subjects and life and career skills, that stimulates the imagination and introduce students to new areas of their world. So how do we do that? One of the ways is to take them on field trips, take them to important places in the community. Obviously that's restricted now during the pandemic, 
But later in this pre presentation, I will show you what I plan to do as a substitute for the field trips I had planned for my college course. Uh, this reminds me of a memorable, a memorable time. I took two of my classes to an art museum. I was teaching high school. I planned everything for the trip, permission slips, medical forms, collected money, got a transportation grant for the bus, arranged for students to miss other classes, did activities in advance so they were familiar with what they were going to see, had activities on the bus, even made cookies and thank you notes for our docents and bus driver. The day of the trip, everyone was in the bus. I counted heads. Once we arrived and were in the museum, I counted all the students again and found that I had one extra student. He had stowed away under the back seat of the back of the bus where I couldn't see him. As a teacher, you worry about losing a kid, but not gaining one. So anyway, back to the topic at hand. Um, from Career Builders 2018 hiring forecast, 33 to 65%, depending on the source of children entering primary school today, will work in jobs that do not exist. There is also considered a skill gaps in many people, whether the much publicized skills gap is due to unprepared applicants or employer created factors, the challenge is what should we do to give students the skills their ultimately need for work. Integrated learning is key to a good education and building life skills because it has the potential to build improved critical thinking where students should improve their analysis abilities by using approaches from different disciplines, better bias recognition to solve a problem, students must typically use information rooted in a range of perspectives. This can challenge their pre-existing ideas to help them identify bias in themselves and others. Preparation for future problems. Challenges that face people in real life require a variety of skills, knowledge, and experiences, and problem solving. That's central to our everyday living and work. Problem solving means learning from failure. These are a list of the top 10 skills sought by employers. On the right, it's from 2015, and on the left, it's in 2020 or now. We can see that the first one, complex problem solving, is still in slot number one over the last five years. Then things change slightly with the skills in different places except that quality control and active listening have been replaced with emotional intelligence and cognitive flexibility, which are new. So what do we know about the future of education? Not much, but we do know that according to many experts, the world is changing faster than at any other time in human history we carry devices in which we can easily get the answers to most of our questions. We have to de-emphasize standardized tests and pandemics and climate change have a profound impact on education. I thought we'd do a poll right now. What I'd like you to do is to please put in the chat what you think is one thing that you think needs to be changed in education and one thing that you think needs to be preserved in education. And, and Dakota will monitor the chat and group your answers. So why don't we do this in two minutes and then I'll get back to the talk.
Okay. So we'll look at those in a few minutes. So what is the purpose of education? The purpose of education falls within these four categories, economic, cultural, social, and personal. I mentioned Ken Robinson earlier. If any of you have seen any talks by him, he makes a cogent argument that children have the innate curiosity and playfulness, sociability, and willfulness that they bring to school that should make them very successful. He calls for a major transformation to improve a broken model. Education is a human process, not a mechanical process. We have to reach the passion of each student. You know, if you're loving what you're doing, an hour can equal feel like five minutes. In reverse, if you don't like what you're doing, doesn't five minutes feel like an hour? Passion varies with each student. Humans are very individualized. At last year's symposium, the 40 people who attended were mostly teachers and educational administrators. They came together to work with the design challenge of improving education. We use the design process of problem solving, which I will talk about. Everyone is put in a team of three to four people. We had five minute talks by seven participants who discussed a particular innovation in education. We listened to two panels with six people from six different countries who talked about successful elements in education in their countries. And the teams worked then for two days. I'm showing here some of the artifacts of their work. As you can see, there are a lot of post-it notes. And the lower left shows a presentation by one of the teams. So we had seven teams in each, each group gave a presentation of their, on a particular topic that they worked with. Here's some more examples of some of the work that was done. The lower left corner, <clears throat> shows an example of our visual note taker who drew and wrote what speakers were saying and documented the whole event that way. It's just a fascinating process. After the symposium, a small committee and I synthesized each team's work. The teams were color coded, hence the different colored headings. Out of that work came a final report. Um, Dakota is going to post that so it will be available for you to look at if you're interested. Two of the overarching concepts that emerged were healing systems and individuals and student-centered education. Now there are many aspects to these um, and it, they're listed here again. I'm not going to go through all of them, but this will be available for you to look at equity assessment, a dynamic learning community, empowering students, nurturing well-being, changing mindsets, increasing diverse ways of knowing, developing self-regulated learning. All of these could be a topic in themselves. Within those two overarching concepts were statements about the conditions that are impacting education. Educational agency has been decreased. In other words, educators are not always looked at as the experts in their field. Decisions about what takes place in schools is highly influenced by people outside of school. Now, nearly everyone has had an education, but that doesn't really make them an expert. If I can compare that to the fact that probably all of us have spent time in a doctor's office maybe even a hospital, we've had physical exams, so on and so forth, we still wouldn't consider ourselves experts in medicine. Teachers study how to effectively teach to a variety of learners who have different needs, different learning paces and styles, and different dispositions. They study how to teach. Indicators of student success are too dependent on the narrow indicator of standardized testing and academic silos or teaching each subject area 
separate from each other inhibits authentic learning experiences. Teaching each subject separately makes it difficult for students to make connections. Teaching concepts from a variety of disciplines through a central theme is called transdisciplinary instruction or interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary. There are a lot of terms for it, but it's a combination of concepts from different disciplines at once. That helps connect parts to whole. I will explain a little more about this in the next few slides. <clears throat> During the presentations at the symposium, the teams all used graphic representations along with verbal and written descriptions of their final ideas. I show you this because of the mixed use of written words and images used to communicate. The teams came up with predictions of where we need to go to redesign education. These actually are similar to some other predictions made by certain organizations worldwide. So now I'm just going to do one other poll for one minute. I'd like you to put in the chat a memorable experience in your education. Okay, we'll move on. I mentioned earlier the design process of problem solving as what the teams at the symposium used to work through the challenge of improving education. This is part of my research area. It's an approach that some educators use to foster innovation. Students start by defining a challenge and work through a series of steps to come up with a viable solution. Where do good ideas come from? Research has shown that the best ideas happen in a group. A new idea is a configuration of a network of other ideas. In workshops I do, I place people in groups of three to four, finding that that's the best number where there aren't too few or too many, but it works most effectively with that smaller group. Similarly, staying in separate subject matter silos isn't how the world works. The world is complex and interconnected. So using this model of working through these steps is very transdisciplinary. In other words, most challenges require using steps from math, science, visual arts, movement, engineering, technology, and so on, looking at the challenge across subject areas. So we start with step one. Like we do in writing something, we define a challenge as starting with the who, the what, the when, where, why, and how questions. Who is the audience involved with this challenge? What is the purpose? Why is this needed? And so on. After that, the teams do some research on their, maybe their user group that they're working with. In other words, the who the audience for this challenge is and the purpose and so on and so forth. So they can do research through traditional ways of looking at publications or going to the internet. They might use a focus group. They could do observations, role playing, interviewing or surveying. 
research is a very important step that needs to be done. And after that, once the group has shared the research, they could divvy up the, the different areas of research and then they come together and talk about what they've found, then they're ready to brainstorm some possible solutions. Brainstorming is a way of getting a lot of ideas without judgment out visibly. So I'm showing here post-it notes. Again, individuals could do post-it notes, but it's important to do something like a mind map that you see in the lower right where you have a central focus and then just write down what people think of very quickly without taking a lot of time to come up with just the right answer. It's just put things down creatively. And from those mind maps or brainstorming ex exercises, <clears throat> then the team decides on one or combination of factors that really would work as a final solution. And they make a prototype. The prototype could look like these drawings, these annotated drawings that, that explain how things function and then shows the aesthetic, or it could actually mean creating something three-dimensional. It could be just a simple thing put together like you see in the upper left corner, you know, just objects together that could look like the the actual final thing in the hand. It could just be something um, that actually was created in a maker space that I'm going to talk about this afternoon that really looks like the object, the final object, and is functional. Once the groups have created their prototype, it's best to do a presentation board because it's going to be expected that they present this idea to a group of maybe their peers, maybe as a teacher, you would bring in experts in the field that they're discussing, uh, maybe other faculty members, administrators, community members, but they would have an audience that they're presenting their challenge and their final prototype solution to I'm showing a presentation board that then goes through some of the steps of the thought process that they used in coming up to, the, to that final solution. The audience offers feedback, they ask questions that after which the team can reflect on and then decide some of the things that came up if they were worth using to refine their final solution. Through the top of this slide, I'm showing other presentation boards that would, were created by some high school students for a park. I'm going to talk about that this afternoon. The last part of this talk, I'm briefly going to explain how I'm changing my two courses this fall from face-to-face -to, -face to remote instruction. The design education course that I'm teaching was developed in partnership with community museums. The students were going to take four field trips to Stan Hewitt, which is an Akron historic landmark that includes acres of gardens, a creative play space, a carriage house, and a main mansion. And we're going to make two visits we were going to make two visits to the Kent State Museum, which houses collections of fashion and decorative arts. Students were going to do activities on site, conduct historical research, meet with museum experts, and write lesson plans based on what they learned. I will mention that I teach future teachers. And so when I said they're going to write lesson plans, it's to prepare them for teaching in the schools. Now, I was really excited about these field trips and this new course. This is a brand new course that was going to be taught on site. And I had arranged with uh, the different experts at these museums to speak to my students. And we were going to do activities while we were there, some self-exploration. Well, now we're shifting and it's going to be remote. So I'm going to be using videos produced by the museums 
for instance, Stan Hewitt has drone videos that give an aerial view of the landscape and playground and close up virtual tours of the interior of the mansion. We will still meet with the experts, we'll just do it online. The education director, an architect, landscape architect, and a curator will be speaking to my students. It won't be the same as being there by any means, but the drone videos would not have been produced or available if it weren't for the restrictions from this pandemic. That will be an interesting view for my students to see the grounds from the air, which they wouldn't have had if we had been on site. So I'm trying to look at some of the positives that are coming out of this. For the Kent State Museum, two exhibits will be viewed. We'll meet virtually with one of the fashion designers whose exhibit will be up. And then we're also going to meet <clears throat> with the museum director who will talk to us about aspects of fashion and culture. Now, another way that I'm shifting, a lot of our student teachers will not be able to be in schools and working with stu students face to face. They do field experiences and student teachers in all of our courses. And so we're planning now to have them teach remotely. But I also thought it would be really interesting if we would work with simulations. And this is showing one program that uses avatars. These students are avatars that are controlled by, in movement and voice by actors. Uh, Kent State paid for a license this year to use these simulations. And we're going to have students from a variety of disciplines work with them. There will be the education departments that are going to use the simulations, counseling can use them, and some other areas that want to practice interviewing for jobs can use simulations. So I'm excited. I've never done this before. But what I like about it is that it will allow our student teachers to teach in a classroom with avatars rather than practicing on real people. For instance, one of the things that we can do in the simulations is practice disciplining. And no matter what school you're in, sometimes you are faced with some discipline challenges. So we can have some very cooperative avatars and we can ratchet it up to very disruptive students. So it will give our student teachers a chance to practice that um, before they have to do it in real time. Another thing that I'm excited about is that we're going to experiment with virtual reality. Virtual reality headsets can be expensive or inexpensive. The difference is that the inexpensive headsets allow the person to see a 3D version feeling as if you're at the site, but the higher end headsets allow the person to interact with the environment and other people who join you in that environment. Now we're going to use inexpensive virtual reality headsets. Those cost around $8 or the students can actually make them from cardboard and a template that I have. So we're going to experiment with this. A smartphone is inserted in the front and that provides the three-dimensional experience. Now you could visit another planet or a star with molten lava. You could go to another country. You could visit landmarks, be at the top of a mountain, go do museum tours. So there, there are a variety of ways that this could be pretty exciting, and we'll see what emerges from it. In conclusion, these are some of the approaches that could be used to shape a better world. There certainly are other ideas. But the way students have been taught hasn't radically changed for a century until this year. This year will speed up the slow transformation that was starting to happen. We will see things shift in ways that we couldn't imagine prior to this transition to remote learning. But added the benefits of technology 
and the cultural changes that are happening around the world, we will see things be different in the future. So thank you, that concludes my presentation. And we could now work with the questions that you have for me. So I will stop sharing. Here we go. Well, thank you. There's so many ideas that come out of that. I can just imagine putting this together. Um, you're tying a lot of it into your plans, like you said, for this fall, which is exciting, but a lot at the same time. Right. Um, so we did have a couple of the answers through poll questions that came in um, a lot on Facebook. We have some people who are responding there. Um, so the first poll, I don't know if you wanna go through some of those answers and, and what came up, but the first poll you had mentioned, what were things that you would like to change about education and things that you would like to keep the same. Um, so I moved a, a few of those into the chat. Thank you everyone who responded on Facebook. Um, many of those answers, so I'll go through some of those. Uh, changing standardization and preserving social interaction. Uh, testing should be changed and more life skills added, uh, more life skills oriented, banking, investing, insurance, mortgages, business strategy, but keep the history and uh, delete standardized tests and keep the arts. So there was a trend that we noticed in that poll. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, when I was putting this together, I was afraid I was kind of leading your thinking about standardized tests, but honestly we have found and through research that standardized tests are not the answer. Um, it, it again, it just, it focuses on this narrow way to assess students and we know that they have very different aspects to their personalities, to their understanding of the world and to the way they do things. So we really do need to broaden that. So um, even if I did influence your thinking on standardized tests, I think it's one of the answers of why we need to change things. So I appreciate that confirmation from some of you. Mm -hmm. and, and I also appreciate the idea that the arts should not be downplayed. Um, that's one of the things through standardized tests that has been a, a side problem is that there's been more of an emphasis on math and English language arts and maybe science than there is on the visual arts, music, uh, even history, social studies, some of the other things that we have typically thought of as being very important to a well-rounded education. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be downplaying those. It should all be worked together. And, and obviously, I think one of the answers is using the design process of problem solving because mm -hmm. you actually apply concepts that you need to the challenge you're using. So I mentioned using math or looking up science concepts or thinking about the aesthetic side of things, which would be the visual arts or, or movement or whatever. And that all brings it together in a way that that students care about at the time. Mm -hmm. The way we teach now is that we expose them to a variety of, of ideas and how to do things, which isn't a, a bad way to approach things, but they need to practice applying those concepts and it needs to have relevance to them. Mm -hmm. What I have found in working with the design process of problem solving that provides that application experience and and also makes it relevant to them to want to know the answers. And so it has been successful. Mm -hmm. That relevance aspect is what makes it stick with you and, and feel confident moving into the future too, which was um, something that I wrote down from one of your slides was the empowerment that comes from this type of learning um, in an atmosphere where it's just um, regurgitating information. Um, you don't get the empowerment to learn in the future. Right. And, uh, so then we did have a couple people who commented too on your second poll about memorable um, educational opportunities. And it's interesting because the two responses that came from Facebook were both trips. 
So they were educational trips. One was a semester at Oxford and one was a train trip to Washington DC and to New York City as a senior in high school. So it's interesting that the out of classroom um, experience is, is what sticks with you. I know, and obviously being there is the most effective. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping this visual or this virtual reality experience we'll be trying will be second best. Mm -hmm. And actually be there right now, but even in the future, it wouldn't be possible to take our high school students necessarily to Paris or to Egypt or wherever we might want them to experience something. So through virtual reality, it can give that simulated experience of being there mm -hmm. and help students you know, better understand what it's about and why we would even be discussing things that are important there. Right, exactly. One of the earlier uh, weeks of this season, we had some cancellations just for our Chautauqua Lecture Series. And um, one thing that came from actually my intern had a really great idea to look on Google um, Culture, Arts and Culture, and you can go and you, if you have a, a VR, you can walk through tours um, all around the world, museums and exhibits. And we tried to give um, some options for those because though we none of us can travel right now, um, being able to experience those in virtual reality is another option that gives you at least two, a bucket list of places you wanna go in the future and a, a way to learn outside of your living room. So right. I agree. I think that um, it's wonderful to be able to have those opportunities in person is wonderful, um, but, but, but anything is better than, um, than not learning and, and going back to the old ways. Right. And, mm -hmm. and when I figured out that you could make these things for practically $3 out of cardboard, now I haven't done it. Um, so I don't know how effective they are, but supposedly they work, mm -hmm. but I did purchase some for $8 a piece. So that does give the experience that you feel like you're there. Now, right. like I mentioned the more expensive headsets, you then can feel like you're touching things. You interact with people in the space. I mean, it's incredible. My friends who use those, they say, you know, you you really feel like you're in the room with, with people and, and mm -hmm. having an interaction feels real. I, it's mind boggling. Right. I'm assuming there's going to be a lot more of those uh, sets that are sold for Christmas this year as we're staying in socializing <laughs> distance socially. Um, we, we might be seeing more of those pass around and on Christmas lists. Right. Um, did have a question too come in on Facebook. If we want to shift to questions now, that's all right. Um, someone brought up that there was a rush to put courses online in the spring at both the K through 12 and university levels. And it resulted sometimes in poorly designed courses and lack of fully prepared instructors. Um, this gave a bad name too to online learning. And do you think there's a way that this can be undone? Yes. Boy, educators were put in such a difficult position as were parents and students. I mean, it was tough to sh make that shift so quickly in the spring. And people weren't prepared. The teachers openly say that I never thought I'd have to be teaching this way. So it, it was very difficult. And at our university, um, I was really impressed with our, our IT people, our technology people, our educational technologists and how they got things in place right away. I mean, we had like two days and a weekend without students. So there were four days that our IT people got things up online, tutorials, how to do things and help prepare faculty once we got back to working with students on the Monday after we went remote. So at K-12 schools might not have had, not all of them have had that kind of technology capability to do that so easily. And some of the school districts had to just kind of back off on teaching the kinds of things that they wanted to, or that they typically would have if things had been in person. But what I have found that over the summer, many educators, if not practically all, 
have really been preparing for the fall, most knowing that this is what we were going to be facing. At our university, 800 faculty took workshops over the summer to prepare them to teach remote courses and in, in an engaging way, you know, doing things like, like polling, more sophisticated than I just did, um, uh, breakout groups, um, uh, let's see, some of the other, Miro brainstorming, their brainstorming apps and, and uh, classroom management apps. There's a lot of stuff that could be studied and used in teaching remotely that really work. And it doesn't make you feel like you're face to face, but it is a good substitute. And it's the community building aspect of doing remote instruction. That's one thing I'm finding with teachers of all age groups, that they are thinking much more about community building through remote than they might necessarily have in face-to-face. -face. Because face-to-face, -face, you kind of take it for granted that students will kind of connect with each other and you as the instructor. But through remote, you have to be much more aware of how to do that. I think it's one of the positives that might be coming out of this remote approach because people are thinking about how you get students to interact with each other and feel a connection. And, and some of those that might have been really reserved and reticent about getting to know each other in a in a face-to-face -face manner. So, so that's kind of an interesting thing that's coming out of all of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I keep thinking, uh, even just transitioning what we've done so far, everyone, I want to, I do want to take a second to thank everyone who has been so involved in our virtual season so far, and Dr. Van Zandt too, for transitioning your programs to virtual, which were not um, completely the intent whenever we started all of this, it just kind of fit into what we were going to do anyway. Um, but I am appreciative of the audience that we had this summer when we've transitioned to something so different from on site, but I continually think as we're planning, and I'm sure you do too, that thank goodness we do have those resources because otherwise it would be um, really nothing to be offered right now. We'll just be planning completely um, like mail-in services. I, I keep thinking about the early Chautauqua days where you would send away for a uh, book and then you would read the book and then you'd send back a book report and that was how you would get your degree. And <laughs> thank goodness we're past that stage. Yeah, right. it's a different step, right? Well, just an aside and how this is affecting other things, even outside of education. Um, my family was going to have a family reunion on Labor Day weekend, and now we're not going to do that. And so I made the suggestion that we do a Zoom family reunion. Now, a lot of the people who aren't familiar with technology just kind of freaked out, but right. you know, um, I explained how to do this Easily, all you have to do is click on the link and put in the password, and we'll be able to see each other from people all over the country, people that we wouldn't have seen face to face, mm -hmm. so or haven't seen for years. So, you know, I hope it's successful. We'll see, but <laughs> but it is it's just a new way of thinking about things that we just didn't have to do before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a whole new world to explore um, and to learn more about. So. Well, we haven't had any more questions come in, but I want to remind everyone that uh, Dr. Van Azan will be back again this afternoon at 1.30, so in just a few hours here, and she's going to be talk talking about makerspaces, uh, which may be something new to our audience, so that'll be an interesting second lecture. And then as a second reminder, too, going along with what she's discussing, because of all the changes that have happened this summer, we at Lakeside would really like to hear your suggestions uh, for the future seasons and your review of this season, um, taking all of that into consideration as we start to plan for next year. So I'll be sending out and we'll be posting a survey on the 2020 season, both the virtual aspect and the education program. So please be on the lookout for those um, in, in the coming week, hopefully we'll have that posted. So uh, again, thank you, Dr. Van de Zand, for this morning. We appreciate you being here, though we wish you were here uh, with us in Lakeside, no. uh, but we will see you this afternoon. Good. Thank you, Dakota.